Hello, everyone, uh, to the CNN uh, stream. As the uh, human and economic toll of the war in Ukraine mounts, efforts to reach a negotiated settlement have intensified. However, they go hand in hand with escalating aggression from Russia. Joining me now to discuss the situation on the ground in Kiev and elsewhere uh, in the country is uh, Peter Zolmayev, the director of the Eurasia uh, Democracy Initiative, a specialist on uh, post-Soviet states. And uh, we have reached him today. He was until recently near Kiev, now possibly. He's going to tell us where he, where he, uh, where he is. Uh, Peter, thank you so much for joining us. Appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you, Christos. Uh, so there's a lot there's a lot to discuss obviously a lot going on but let's start with you um giving us a, a clear picture on what is the situation where you are right now on the ground uh and what is your personal take and experience well i'm uh, within like two hour range from kiev i was in kiev today that was a different story i'll uh, just to start where i am it's a relatively safe uh, location right now even though like a week ago there was a Artil uh, uh, an artillery attack on a uh, on the airport and the airport was destroyed and 10 people died and you see something like this happens and you tell uh people that it's relatively quiet just to, to give you an idea that even western parts anything west of kiev east of kiev nowhere in ukraine is it fully safe uh, vladimir putin unleashed a wholesale attack on the country with the with the goal of bringing ukrainians to their knees uh intimidating them making clear that he will stop at nothing and no one to bring ukraine under control it's a colonial kind of uh, expansion if you will it's a colonial war it's a war of conquest uh which Vladimir putin has you know uh, obviously uh, resorted to various ways to describe what is happening. He's talked about NATO expansion, he's talked about this, that, or the other, but the, you know, the idea is clear what's happening. So I'm kind of like switching, you know, from explaining, you know, trying to describe what's happening here to uh, the larger geopolitical context, because this is how we live right now. You know, the local becomes the global, you know, uh, the country is uh, fighting for its survival. What I saw today in Kiev, and I had meetings with government, uh, with uh, city officials and the deputy mayor of uh, Kiev, who is in charge of the territorial defense. Uh, I mean, they are obviously, you know, they're taking it seriously. Uh, the Russians are massed uh, uh, around Kiev. Um, an attack can happen at any day, even though the understanding is they don't have sufficient forces. Uh, the craziness in Moscow, in the leadership, is sufficient enough to try to pull it off again. Um, I just don't know what the strategy is. Here, everywhere you go in Ukraine, people are under arms. People are resolved to fight. Uh, this is their home. They cannot go anywhere. I mean, they cannot retreat. This is as close as we get to the like 1940s. It's a war of liberation. It's a situation where shades of gray disappear and, and the issue becomes black and white. Even though we're living it in color, the moral uh, of the story is very black and white. We're fighting to, to, for the privilege of living in our country and not living in the Russian gulag. Vladimir Putin wants to impose gulag here. We do not want gulag. We do not want Russian world here. We find it disgusting. We find it ugly, you know? And we want no part of it, no matter what he says about Russians and Ukrainians and how they're close. No more Vladimir Putin. You made clear that no one here wants to be, wants to have anything to do with your country. But you know, you know, Peter, what is contradictory? Uh, we've been reading reports about uh, Russian abandoning vehicles <clears throat> in Ukraine, uh, valuable and expensive uh, military equipment uh, that is uh, being captured uh, by, by Ukraine. But on the other hand, um, you know, missiles keep hitting hard. Uh, military targets, unfortunately, with civilian casualties. What is your understanding about this? And more generally, about the ability of the Russians to deploy and to possibly invade the capital? We are, have seen that Vladimir Putin has increasingly resorted to uh, war crimes, essentially, in his prosecution of the war. Uh, it is clear that his idea of a fast and victorious, quick and victorious war, a blitzkrieg, failed miserably. 
He expected to take Kiev within 72 hours. He packed his troops with parade clothes, you know, <laughs> They're ready to parade down Krishatik, our main street in Kiev. That hasn't happened. And so he is now, he has switched to this vengeance mode, vengeance slash intimidation. It's part intimidation, part still believing he can terrify enough people and force enough people to leave across the borders so that there's just complete mayhem and Europeans beg him to come to some kind of agreement. You know, he just wants to create a lot of misery and chaos. At the same time, it's, he's also being vengeful. He is hating Ukraine because it just won't submit to him. It's, it's Freudian, it's psychotic. There's all these elements. There's an element of uh, Eastern Orthodox fascism and his ideas that he has about the country, you know, and about the need to control. So what I'm saying is you try to understand this behavior, which is barbaric from a man who called Ukrainians part of his own people. So he turned on them now and he's killing them. This is suicidal. This is like literal meaning of suicide. This is what Russian Federation is committing. Yeah. So right now I will tell you that, yes, it's, it's horrible misery. I was in Kiev last night. I was going to bed at 11 p.m. and my bed shook. Turns out five kilometers away, there was a shopping center hit and totally destroyed. What we're seeing in Kiev is Aleppo and Grozny. Putin has already proven that he is capable of this. So the question now is how do we stop, obviously? Do we believe in any peace negotiations with Putin? Is he using them just as a disguise, right? To continue doing, to, I guess, a smoke screen? Uh, what is the Western response going to be? My task here, being where I am right now, is to appeal directly to policymakers through my appearances, frequent appearances on uh, world media, and to ask for a strong response. I know NATO will not close uh, airspace. We understand the implications of it. What our message is simple, allow Ukrainians to control their own airspace, give them as many weapons as they need. Don't be afraid, don't be cowed by Putin, because the war in Ukraine is a war for all of you. So, so you're saying, I mean, President Zelensky called on the EU to, to suspend all trade with Russia. Uh, does Europe and the US need to do more, in your opinion? And, and if yes, in what direction? Uh, you know, the Ukrainians are, are showing great resistance, but what is it that they truly need to be able to maintain the fight in terms of help from the West uh, that has promised military assistance, but not action? Uh, well, obviously, when it comes to, when it comes to economic sanctions, uh, they take time to work. It's clear. They have been ruinous to Russia's economy, but they haven't been ruinous, to, ruinous apparently, to Vladimir Putin's regime. There's a little bit, where there's, a, there's a, you know, according to some estimates, he can go on this for a couple of more years, creating more misery for the Russians, but he can still survive. Look at North Korea, that, it has survived for decades. Uh, there is one economic measure that should be taken that's cutting off uh, purchases of oil from Russia. And it's very difficult to understand that Germany consumes 60% of its gas from Russia. So these are all complicated, but they've been making signs that they will be increasingly, uh, and increasingly shorter term, they will be cut, you know, be cut, trying to become independent of Russian energy. Uh, that having said that, when it comes to the other part of it, military, we're talking about air defense systems, uh, including S-300s and those MiGs, the MiG-29s, the, Pol the Poles have shown willingness to trade with the Americans to do it. The Americans backtrack. They think it's maybe too dangerous. I don't want to be a warmonger. But it seems to me, at least the people I deal with and people I read, that this is a very poor moment, once again, to show lack of resolve. There was a formula found in World War II when the Americans transported, uh, you know, uh, uh, fighting, uh, fighter planes to, to Britain during the war, if you remember. The Churchill appealed for that aid. They found a formula without, you know, having to, that was before America entered into the war. They did it through Canada. They did it by ship. Uh, there was a creative way to do it. There's a, the, another creative way can be found. How many more ruined cities can we tolerate before Europe and, and the West and America react? That's the question we have. So what do you think a de-escalation or an end to the war look like? And uh, what would it mean for the, for the two countries? I'm not, uh, I'm not Nostradamus. I'm not a, pro, uh, you know, uh, a force here, unfortunately. 
there are very few people who, who are. You can make educated guesses, try to see some kind of scenario. We all hope it will not come to nuclear war. It's, all of a sudden, we talk about it out in the open. People are increasingly concerned. You know, the Pentagon has warned of Kremlin using uh, a false flag operation involving chemical weapons since even before the invasion. You hear more of it now. Tactical nuclear strike, all these things, you know, uh, you want to avoid that. I'm a human being. We, I have children. We want to avoid that. The hope is Vladimir Putin has children. He has a lot of children with that. <laughs> it turns out. I mean, you would hope that he would use his paternal instincts to, you know, not ruin the world. So there's hope there'll be some kind of a solution. Ukrainians have tried to meet, you know, to welcome di diplomatic initiatives, peace talks, etc. But Vladimir Putin continues to insist on, 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 on things that are just undoable. They are unacceptable. He wants to or Ukrainians to capitulate. That's the only formula so far. I'm not seeing any progress. It's all just window dressing here, this and that. And, you know, it's a, it's a play for time. It seems like Russians want to stretch it out to where they can regroup and still and try to take Kiev by force. I do not believe they will succeed, but they may escalate. And that may be very, very hurtful. But whatever hurtful that is, that scenario means the end of Russia, first of all. And I hope it's not going to be the end of the world. Sure. Let's hope it ends soon. Uh, I want to thank you for your time. Uh, stay safe, and we'll talk again. Thank you, Christos. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, brother.